Danny, and welcome to uh, Time Team again. Uh, rather excited by the subject of this one, uh, Codnor Castle. Uh, just before we kick off, I thought I'd like to show you a copy of this um, version of the report in the Derbyshire Archaeological Society, Ooh. the proceedings of. Um, this is a reprint, and often um, it's a very good idea to both do the main report, which is this one here, the Wessex main report with all the details, but then print a sort of shortened version in the local. Um, why, why is that a good idea for us to be doing both of them? Well, it's just dissemination of information, isn't it? Um, so, um, you know, it's really good to put these um, uh, reports into the local um, journals and publications um, because that's the thing that people locally, you know, people who, are, who have a specialist interest in that area, they're reading those journals, those publications. Um, and, you know, they're kept in libraries forever. I mean, some of these uh, journals go back to, you know, 1800 and odd. Um, and so it's really fantastic to actually um, get that information into there as well, as well as it being on the Internet, too. So I often think now that um, when we when we're looking at a castle site, in, in my mind, I always think archaeological jigsaw puzzle, yeah. <laughs> you know, because somehow it always ends up with we had Richard, Richard K. Morris and Richard was a great um, sorter out of um, bits of um, building, bits of architecture. And I often think of um, Berwick Morley, uh, you know, uh, who was very early on part of the great and good team of people who we work with. And Berwick was brilliant as well at you know, he would say, oh, that's a bit of a sloppy curve there, which makes it Tudor, not Elizabethan, or so those little details. We had a big castle here, um, in theory, nearly a thousand years old. And as usual, you arrive at these things and you think, my goodness, what have we taken on? A great pile of rubble, a great earthwork and all the rest of it. What was your initial reaction to the program and, and having a look through the report? What things stuck in your mind? And we'll get to the big find a bit later on. I think at um, one point, Tony says, you know, we came here to find one castle, but actually we've got several. Uh, and I think that really sums it up really well. It really is a jigsaw, this one. Um, it, it took me a bit of time to actually get my head around it because you've got stuff, you've got a drawbridge, but that actually turns out to be earlier than the entrance to the castle that's still standing. Um, and so there's like multi phases to this. Um, so it's kind of like a palimpsest within itself. Um, and you've got Stuart out um, sort of uh, roaming around the moat, trying to sort of work out uh, landscape gardening. Um, it's, it's actually, there's a lot going on, basically. Um, yeah, it's really I, like, I like the fact that, um, you know, it, it was quite ambitious to take that place on. I mean, it's there are certain sites where you think you've got to be joking. Three days, what on earth? And again, it's down to the geophys targeting the trenches and things like that. Um, and I think what we began to realise was that this thing had developed over time. And I think we managed to get back to the 13th century, didn't we? Yeah, well, in fact, actually, um, in the bottom, right in a proper occupation layer of one of the trenches, um, they actually find a piece of a bit of pottery, Stamford ware, that um, starts being made around the time of the Norman Conquest and stops being made about 1150. So that means that, you know, they'd gone really far back, actually. I think probably further than they expected, actually. Why, why, did, why do you feel this is a good programme for people to watch? Oh, there's loads of reasons. I, I think there's a really nice mix of you've got below ground archaeology and above ground archaeology happening um, in terms of um, you've got people looking at the architectural elements that are left standing. Um, you've got people like Matt digging in the uh, drawbridge and figuring that out, measuring it all out, trying to work out where it would have been. Um, you've got Stuart looking at the landscape element, looking at the gardens, and it all comes together. 
And I think that's really fantastic. It's really great demonstration of all the different elements of archaeology coming together to actually answer a question. And of course, all these castles, when we all imagine a castle, I think we see a sort of tall crenellated tower. Um, we see a drawbridge and we see a moat. Yeah. And in the case of Codnor, that trench we dug out in that moat was probably one of the deepest we've ever done. And it produced mounds of black gloop, which we spread out over um, black plastic. And we had a local metal detectorist working with us, and he had a fairly exciting find, didn't he? Yeah, well, in fact, I think there were two metal detectorists. Um, and yeah, this find is like pretty amazing. Um, the gold noble um, of Henry V, um, and dating probably between 1415 to 1420. So I've got it down to about five years. Um, it was minted in London. Um, and actually, we know whereabouts it was minted in the Tower of London. Um, and so, you know, really fantastic find. These gold coins um, as single finds don't turn up very often. And I think that's because basically, if you've got a gold coin, you're going to make sure you don't drop it. <laughs> um, you do get them in hoards, actually. And the biggest one, the biggest hoard um, was the Fishpool Hoard, uh, which is um, on display, I think, I think it's at the British Museum. Um, and they found about 400 and odd coins. In that hoard were 258 uh, gold nobles, <laughs> which is quite a lot. Um, and of those, um, 45 of them were of this particular type, um, this coin. So it's Class E type coin of Henry V, um, minted at that particular date in, on the Tower of London. And there were 45 of them. <laughs> And I think we should I think we should pause just for a second to say, you know, this is Henry V. This yeah. Henry V of Agincourt, you know, the, the guy who'd 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 in Shakespeare, you know, um talks to his troops the night before the battle. And an Agincourt happens, a, a victory secured by uh, English and Welsh longbows, and one of the great and most important arguable important battles of, 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 of that period. So quite a guy. And on the coin, he sort of sat in a ship. You know, it's all the wrong proportions, really. What's he doing sat in a ship? Um, so uh, that was uh, basically to commemorate a, a battle um, that, um, during the Hundred Years' War. So it's commemorating a battle from 1340. Um, so he's in a ship which represents the, you know, the glory and the might of the English army. And he's holding a sword and he's got his shield and he's got the sails in the background. Um, it's really powerful imagery, actually. And there's actually a poem um, at the time, a little rhyme that I found um, that was written at the time. And it says, for four things our noble showeth unto me, king, ship, sword and power of the sea. Nice. It's quite sweet, isn't it? <laughs> it goes very, very well with the coin. And we talk about coins, we say the obverse side, so the side that's not the head. What's happening on the other side? Uh, on that side, you've basically got lots of kind of, again, more sort of power, symbols of power. So there's lions and shields and, and all kinds of things. Um, but right in the centre of the cross, you've got a cross. And in the middle of that cross is an H and that is the H for Henry V. And, yeah. and there's, a, there's a lovely connection as well with the de Grays who, who actually lived at Codner Castle, um, because one of the de Grays was on the muster roll um, for um, Agincourt. Ah. Uh, so there's a direct link there. That's, uh, that's a lovely set of connections. This is why coins are often so powerful an image that they carry. It's a bit like a form of advertising for the king to get his image out there. And this begins very early on in the Iron Age that, you know, coins do more than just pay for things. They're like, you know, we have the queen on our coins, we have scientists, and in a way that what's on those notes represents current attitudes to people. Um, so I think Alan Turing is about to appear on, on a new note, and that represents social attitudes changing 
and and it's a way of telling the way people thought about things what appears on the coins Danny, very nice to hear from you again. Uh, nice, enjoyable to have these programs to look at. I, I know them often quite well in my memory, some better than others. But when you go back and look at these things and see all the guys working to get that result and then, you know, doing that good job of, of, of the local report and Wessex doing the main report, I, I'm rather proud of the workmanlike job we did on quite a difficult site. So yeah. yeah, definitely worth watching for for many reasons. You've got the find, and then you know this real complex chronology as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Danny. Talk again soon. Cheers, Tim. Thank you. can't do any of this work without you so please subscribe back us on patreon and make sure that time team comes back again